Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast, the podcast where we talk bourbon whiskey and American Civil War history. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Jack, and we've got a special guest here tonight, Mr. Mike Robinson. Uh, tonight, we're actually not doing a bourbon, we're doing a rye whiskey, um, and we'll get a little bit into that um, as the episode goes on as to why, uh, but tonight we've got Catoctin Creek Ragnarok Rye. It's a limited edition uh, rye whiskey from Catoctin Creek over in Purcellville, Virginia, um, so this rye is 100% rye in terms of the mash bill. So there's no other grains used in the making of this whiskey. And it is finished in sugar maple, cherry wood, and rum barrels. So it's got three different finishes on it. So it's got quite the, the uh, flavor profile, which we'll see here in a few minutes. Um, but the reason why we're doing rye, um, our battle tonight is the first battle of Kernstown, and there's a one and only distillery from Winchester back during the Civil War, uh, the Savage and Sons Distillery. And since that distillery is no longer in business, there's no better distillery to do than Catoctin Creek, an award-winning local rye oh. distillery here in Virginia. So without further ado, we will pour a glass and see what we think. Nice pop. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> that was beautiful. That's right. <laughs> All righty. I'll pass that over to you. This is fancy. Yeah, take what you want. Yeah, we are, like Elijah said, we are joined by our second co-host guest of the Thank you. of our mm-hmm. podcast so far. Mr. Mike Robinson. Mike is uh, he's been a we've been talking and friends for a couple of years now. I think ever since you kind of got started with uh, your Winchester Tales and your just whole Tales expedition. Um, you're a history guru, fanatic, metal detecting enthusiast, super passionate, and um, writes great great pieces, uh, books. How many How many are you at now? Nine. Yeah, nine, a part of the Tales series. Um, ranges from the Winchester Tales to just the those plus Civil War Tales in Winchester. And then you have the Ghost. Or no, has that not been published? That's not out yet. Okay. Gonna, I'm going to do Ghost and then uh, I think I'll do Colonial Tales as well at some, oh, man. At some point. Yeah. At some point. Spoiler and it's, it's the, you know, you started it at a perfect time, probably purposefully, I think. Right when COVID hit, or yeah. was it right before COVID? No, it was it was like a COVID project. Yeah, you know? the Winchester Tales page on Facebook. Yeah, which how many likes now? Mm. Uh, Twenty one thousand followers. Yeah, and mm. and so check that out. Winchester Tales is the main page, and then from there you'll just find all the other pages you've created from it. That's right. Um, and it was a huge, you know, success in getting people to connect with their roots and their local history again. And it was just so cool as a history lover myself to see people I'd never thought of liking history or being interested in it, sharing your posts, commenting your post, and just creating a sense of community with history and specifically with the Winchester area. So, um, but, but other than that, we wanted to have you on because of your connection to Kernstown. And that's our battle today is the first battle of Kernstown because it's, where you grew up, you grew up basically on the battlefield yeah. and as a kid hiked and, and climbed and, you know, got dirty all over these fields uh, on the south side of Winchester. Um, but, 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 that's, but that's you. And uh, we thank you so much for coming on. And as you told us going into this, you are not a, not a big bourbon guy or a whiskey guy. No, I, I, I never drank whiskey for for taste texture and and fragrance yeah (laughs) i drank it to get loaded as fast as i possibly could (laughs) so it's a it's a change it's a nice change yeah it's a it's a it's i've matured it matured in this uh in in this uh drink but so i appreciate you guys sure but yeah i mean winchester tales was um something that kind of just came to me because i knew people loved a good story and the timeline of our area is so vast. Mm-hmm. And I always say this, that we're so lucky. to We're, we're different from any other city. I'm, and I'm even saying Boston and Philadelphia and established cities like that, that their timelines aren't as vast and long as ours. Uh, 
you know, we start all the way at the, like the Thunderbird site below Front Royal. That's mm-hmm. Paleo Indian at twelve thousand years. Um, you know, the buffalo herds that came through the Shenandoah Valley uh, created the paths that would lead come, become the war, Great Warrior Path and the Great Wagon Road and Route Eleven. That is all stems from that from those buffalo herds mm-hmm. of, of the you know twelve thousand years ago. So, yeah. so my point was. I saw each of these stories that I was finding in the depths of these books that I was diving into, and I knew they were good. And how I saw them was mini move. They were like mini movies, one and a half minute movies. And if I wrote them like that, with a beginning, middle, and end, um, as a fly on the wall of, of these situations uh, and these people, um, that it would it would resonate. It would, yeah. it would find people and it did. Yeah. And that's all, you know, I, and I, I've, I've told other art, you know, I, I give credit where credit's due. Like I, I talked to Jonathan Noalis and, and mm-hmm. I say, I don't do what you do. Yeah. I'm the stepping stone of getting people interested in something that they can find the full story in your books. Mm-hmm. So if I can get them interested through social media, because I think that's what, what really was missing we have a great historical society. You guys do a great, great job with the battlefields, but there's got to be a way to pull the younger generation yeah. in. And through social media was kind of the way I was going to do it, and it would, and it took off fast. But, um, but yeah, going back to what you were saying, yeah, Kernstown was was something I saw every day. I grew up in Stonebrook, and then we moved to Brookneal, which were side by side subdivisions. So as a kid of the of the mid seventies. Um, I was finding all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. in the creeks and the, all, all around Stonebrook up on Sandy Ridge uh, in Kernstown, um, just running those woods as, yeah. as kids, a gang of kids. We'd just be running around. So that's really kind of what it started with Kernstown. But the funny thing is I would find all that stuff, and, and I had no—I didn't know about the battle. Mm-hmm. I didn't know where the strategic points of the battle were. So by doing— uh, you know, just getting back into history, after I left Los Angeles and came back to, to Winchester, I went back to Shepherd. Mm-hmm. And got and got my degree, um, and I did a lot of research at the the Tyler Moore uh, Civil War Center up there. I can't is it George Tyler Moore? I can't I think remember. so. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so then I started digging into Kernstown deeper, and then uh, just with you guys and the great people at the Kernstown battlefield, um, it's just become my passion now. It's my favorite my favorite battle because I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, it's it's Stonewall Jackson at his worst. Mm-hmm. To me, it is um, just for the fact that he's he's coming off of that Romney campaign after trying to court martial Loring and Gilmer. Mm-hmm. Right? He's he's not the Stonewall Jackson of of Henry House Hill. He's a man I think who hasn't found himself completely yet. You know, he comes to Winchester with with what like ten thousand. By the time Kernstown happens, he's reduced to thirty. 400 i think of of troops that could take the field um at our at odds with loring's old brigade um they always looked at the stonewall brigade as they kind of had a rivalry going as as stonewall looked at them as as his favorite and that you know the first virginia but i think stonewall and winchester at that time was a, was a stonewall that hadn't really truly found his comfort zone his, his place. He had the name, but he didn't have the identity maybe yet, like in your yeah, point of yeah. view. Yeah. And people didn't know him yet as, as a um, field commander. He wasn't a Robert E. Lee where, where wrote out his field tactics and, and everybody knew their job. Stonewall was more on the fly. So what makes Kernstown so important to the, to that first beginning story of Stonewall is it's a battle of miscommunication completely mm-hmm. um and angst and and um retribution because he held grudges as you can tell with loring and gilmer and but also with with garnett at later you know after yeah. the battle of kernstown he held grudges yeah but but that's what i like to do is to study the man who was stonewall jackson and what he may have been done differently yeah um you know hindsight is always twenty twenty in in military especially military tactics um but uh you know, by leaving his, uh, he, he left a wagon train full of ammunition in, in Kernstown or in uh, Stevens City that he should have brought up to the battlefield, but he didn't have, he, he didn't do it. Um, he never told Garnett himself uh, about his, you know, when he sent Fulkerson in up against Pritchard's Hill, he never told him why and he was going to, su- why he was supporting him. He sent a subordinate to tell yeah. Garnett. 
So it's it's kind of interesting to, to the the person of Stonewall Jackson because we've we've made them him into such a magnanimous you know being. History that, views him in a better light after the fact. Well, yeah, and we, and you and, and you don't question his his tactics, but this is this is a flawed general at this time, and he learns from those mistakes and becomes a better field tactician, and I think he better communicator as he gets later in the war. Yeah, so it's, and we'll, it's, it's interesting. We'll we'll dive into it, but first let's. The moment Mike's been dreading, I'm sure, up to this point, or you're going to shoot her down, but let's let's taste this rye whiskey. It smells very good, actually. It smells more like rum to me than whiskey, just based off the rum finish, but... Good. That's yeah. a good one, yeah. 92 proof. Um, that will make your bull run, right? <laughs> Had to make a Civil War joke. <laughs> and they don't state how long this is aged for, so I'm not entirely sure um, the age statement on this, but it's aged in quarter casks, so they're the smaller barrels, so that uh, interaction with the oak and stuff kind of happens a little more rapidly than it would in the larger barrel. Well, that's how you get the color, right? That you yeah, do. yeah, that's yeah. where the color comes from, um, but being in quarter casks and stuff like that, um, I don't think they age it for as long as you normally would in like your standard like 53-gallon barrel. Um, but even still, even though we're doing rye instead of bourbon, um, it follows the same guidelines. Rye whiskey has to be at least 51% rye. And it's 100% rye. <laughs> this one's 100%, so you just knock out all doubt there. Um, same same guidelines as bourbon in that regard, 51% of the main grain to make it what it is, either bourbon or rye. Um, aged in oak barrels, all that stuff. Um, plus, it's cool to talk about rye because that's like the whiskey of choice during the Civil War and the early days of you know, American history before bourbon really took off That's interesting. later on. Well, it kind of goes in, you know, during that, you know, going back to talking about Jackson, you know, so Winchester loved him. So when that happened, when, when, uh, when the Union Army started collecting at Harper's Ferry, and you're talking, you know, Nathaniel Banks and, and Shields and uh, uh, who, was, who else was with? Um, Kimball. Uh, Sed, uh, Sedgwick. And Williams, those four uh, that came th- through Harper's Ferry. And uh, st- when Stonewall had to leave out of town, uh, pretty much the first engagement after uh, Jackson got down to Strasburg and Shields came into town, uh, they had a little engagement north of Hog Creek in Kernstown, right, right around where that bank is, right around where the old rubber maid is. And that's where... Uh, that Ashby and Naden Bush, the Confederates, were uh, they hit the first lines of of Shields guys right around where Savage would have had his distillery. You know, I'm sitting there looking at this crock. This in, it's amazing condition, but he was making rye. Is that you know? Mm-hmm. And it kind of makes you wonder. You know, we saw the picture of him, and, and I don't know if we'll be yeah, able we'll put we'll post, post all it. that. Yeah. I mean, he just looks like a guy who knew his whiskey. I can mm-hmm. tell you that. With yeah, his, his long pipe. But it's amazing that that first action of, of Kernstown happened on Savage's property. And he would turn this around after the war and become, you know. And he, he create start, the distillery. And... Yeah, he, and it was, it was a big deal. I mean, he, he was big enough to have a distillery that uh, the old pictures show that was, uh, had a smokestack. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a big operation. Um, and he had a storefront on Loudon Street in the uh, 1870s. And... Um, and this is where this crock would have come from. And we were just talking about it. You would probably get this filled and then refilled as you came yeah. in, cork it and take it home with you. But it would have been that, do you think it was 100 proof probably then? I'm sure. I think some of the stuff back in the day was like straight out of the bar- like barrel proof. Mm-hmm. So normally barrel proof stuff is in the 125, 130 proof. It's hot. Yeah, it's, it's stuff that's like straight off the still, straight into the barrel. I don't think they dabbled in proofing stuff down too much back in the earlier days. Yeah. I think that's more of a modern innovation in terms of whiskey. Um, no wonder Savage looked like he did. He put yeah. some hair on your chest. Yeah, sure. put that hair yeah. on his face. Oh, and man. Uh, he was... <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's cool. You guys will see the picture of it um, when we post the picture of the crock. But it says pure Kernstown rye, which I think is just so cool because it's like that meant something back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and right across the street from there would would have been um, 
the really the only standing structure in Kernstown that's still there. Still there, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, the tavern. It has mm-hmm. the columns, and it, the name escapes me. Uh, Beamer. Mm-hmm. It was the Beamer Tavern. So right across from that little bank on the corner was is, was that was the original. It would have been there when when Savage had his house on that corner and his distillery, which wow. is kind of cool. And it's like it's cool to think that Hog Run could have you know provided water for the distillery. Oh, no doubt. Obviously, and it's the same creek where you know I'm sure men will seek safety during the battles that st- not just this one, first Curtin's town, but second Curtin's town and second Winchester and all these other battles that form and skirmishes that happen there. So, um, yeah. And, and to kind of to set up the battle before we get into it, it's just set up the g- geography of the area. Curtin's town itself. When you look at a map and you read about it was a village, a small village, about five miles south of the heart of Winchester, which was the, yeah. the town that, you know, the old town area we know today. So it's about five miles south. If you drive the Valley Pike today or Route 11, you wouldn't notice a difference. There's not a break, but back then, back during the war, it was farm fields for those five miles until you hit the town of Winchester. Uh, all today, it's car dealerships and things like that, and there's not a break in the terrain. But uh, it was a separate village. Um, I think today the the city limits bump up to Hog Creek, but um, like you said, it's it's neat to know that there's just one surviving structure of that original village that's there, yeah. encompassed around a bunch of modern development. Um, but there's a huge, and we'll talk about this at the end, the amount of preservation that's taken place there. Um, but there, the Kernstown battlefield itself is pretty large, and despite the despite the disadvantages with development and roads being built and all those things that separate and destroy battlefields. Um, there's two pretty large portions of the battlefield that have been preserved and you can access today. But um, leading up to this, like you said, Jackson was, was North. He was on the banks of the Potomac river. He was West all the way to, you know, Romney and Bath or modern day Berkeley Springs. And he was back in Winchester. And then he was, um, the Federals were coming, and he heads south all the way to like Mount Jackson, and now he's heading back north. And um, you know, Ashby's men were, you say, close to where Savage's house was on along the east side of uh, the Valley Pike, next to Hog Run, is where Ashby's men will come up um, and kind of begin the the initial phases of the of the first Battle of Kernstown. So we're we're looking at March twenty third of eighteen sixty two. Uh, for this battle, and it's a it's a cold day. Yeah, and and they they pulled out a day. It, it's it's a ama- kind of amazing that Stonewall got out on think March twelfth. Yeah, and on March eleventh, he pulled his officers in at Alta Vista, the up on Braddock Street, and uh, and formulated a, pl- a nighttime attack plan. Uh, he wanted to attack the camps where they were outside of Stevenson's Depot is where he wanted to attack the uh, the Union Army at night. All of them, all of his subordinates voted against it, especially Garnett. And I think that's where the first, because he told Sandy Pendleton later on, he said, that's the last war council I'll ever hold. Yeah, yeah. And it was. And I think he held that grudge with Garnett that at that moment. I think he had it anyway, but I think that really set him off. So on the 12th, they make the move. So they start off and they stop in, in Newtown. Shields, they press. They come they come into Winchester and they press. And they get them, I think, all the way down. I think they started getting some resistance, I think, below uh, Stephen City, Newtown. But they push back up. Stonewall tells Turner Ashby to... to to press back up into Winchester. And I think they get all the way up to, they get all the way up past the Burger King on, on, on uh, Cedar Creek grade in, mm-hmm. in Valley right about there. They start, that's where Turner Ashby was kind of set right there. They were shell choose battery was, was in support of Turner Ashby and was, was lobbing shells probably around where Ward's Plaza is. Um, and one of those shells fragments hits shields in the arm and breaks his arm right around right that midsection of, of Valley right there where the Ford dealership mm-hmm. was and right around Hollingsworth mill. Yeah. So that kind of sets, that sets it off. But the thing is what's so funny, and this is where it, where it's, it, it, this is where it starts of the communication breakdown. 
Turner Ashby reports that they only have 3,000, you know, goes back, gets back to Jackson. Jackson says, well, 3,000. Okay. I can, I can handle that. Not knowing that they've got reserve 3,500 in reserve north of, of town. So this kind of starts off badly. Um, so Jackson makes the move to start coming north. Um, I think they, to, to go back, I think the, the, uh, I think Shields pressed them all the way to Strasburg, almost, maybe a little past Strasburg, because I remember they got pushed back by Ashby originally. So they put, they got pulled back to Strasburg and then went, went back to Winchester. But that's kind of how it all started. And the thing is, this battle really didn't get really cooking until about noon or one o'clock because of that Ashby, Naden Bush, uh, and, and uh, the Union. And that line. happens with Ashby pushing up to like the area of, I guess that would be considered Milltown. Yeah. Like yeah. The, just, just a little bit north there on, on pa- Valley. Yeah, Parkins Mill and Hollingsworth Mill were right there yeah. in Milltown. And, and th- this is a couple days before the battle that we knew. Yeah. So, so this is Ashby testing, like you said, the breakdown of communication. Ashby, you know, well, it's it's so much of a miscommunication because once Shields gets gets wounded, he goes back to the Seaver House over on on uh, Boscowan, mm-hmm. and um, and Shields all the way up through the day is still thinking he's taking on you know seven hundred of Ash of uh, Turner Ashby's men. Yeah, he doesn't really understand the, the the gravity yet of of the situation. At the same time. Stonewall's making his 24 mile march up the Valley Road and it kind of sets up right around uh, south of, of the Opegan Church. I would say where the uh, old General Electric plant is, which is now the Rubbermaid warehouse there on uh, Apple Valley Road mm-hmm. as it meets. So, right around in that area. So, at the same time, Shields puts uh, Nathan Kimball in, in, uh, in charge. So what does Kimball do, and what does what does Turner Ashby do? He misses the greatest opportunity to take the high position at Pritchard's Hill because he pulls back to right around where Camp Russell is. That's so just where, north of Newtown. Yeah, he 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 pulled back to, right around there, um, and it gives gives Kimball the opportunity to set up those guns up on on Pritchard's Hill. Yeah, and to, I guess to let's set that up more with the geography is with Kernstown where it's at. The Valley Pike is obviously the thing that connects Winchester to Kernstown and many other towns throughout the valley. On um, Hog Creek, this creek we were talking about um, cuts across, runs, you know, the the Valley Pike runs north to south, let's say. Hog Creek runs west to east um, towards, and it flows into the Opecan, I believe. Yeah, and, um, and, and what's, what's amazing about that area I mean, the Opecan Presbyterian Church that's there now. Prior to that, there was a there was an earlier church structure, but that goes all the back all the way back to Yost Height and to William Hogg, or Hogue. Mm-hmm. You know, they think they've they've it was a mispronunciation over the years that it became Hogg. You know, because they thought mm-hmm. that the hogs were maybe yeah. feeding around there or something like that. But um, William Hogue settled that that land right there. So if you're up on that hill, the big promontory on, on that property is what they would call the uh, Pritchard's Hill because the Pritchard family built mm-hmm. that brick house that's there now. But if you're up there, you can look all the way across in the horizon. You can see uh, Ashby Gap. You can see um, Castleman uh, Gap of Route 7. You can see all the way to Strasburg at Massanutten Mountain. You can see the gaps of Luray. I mean, you can see, I mean, f- all over. Yeah. You've got an incredible panoramic view. But off to your, if you're facing out and facing south, it's open fields. Yeah. Okay. And then off to your right, off in the distance would be a kind of, I call it a spine that runs, uh, which would be called Sandy Ridge. And these run roughly north and south. That's right. Um, Pritchard's Hill is on the, east, the west side of the Valley Pike or Route 11 running north to south. And it ends right at hog run as it's coming across the valley pike there but it runs parallel with the valley pike and like mike said has this great vista and commands any approach for miles yeah and like you said ashby missed an opportunity to take it but uh kimball is going to take the and ashby didn't have that four um i think i think stonewall gave him four regiments uh to support him in that sec, kind of the I call it the second kind of phase. So at that point, I don't think he had that support, infantry support at that time, to 
think about taking that that hill. So by the time that they're all lined back up and they're they're kind of hanging below, south of Opec and Church and Stonewall is kind of assessing that situation. Uh, um, and, and I still don't understand with with such a tactician why he would send Fulkerson on a direct assault on a on a position like Pritchard's Hill it, 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 with with artillery that could just rain down on you. Right. Uh, they were in perfect. I mean perfect distance everything um shooting canister and solid shot down on those guys it didn't take long for them they took you know it took about 80 casualties in that in that field and that's where stonewall there's a it, it's really cool what uh kernstown battlefield those guys have done some really cool things um they there's an area called barton's woods uh that which is off of uh shady lane uh shady elm yeah. lane yeah yep. shady elm yep. Um, that turns into Apple Valley, but they put a little stand there where mm-hmm. where, where they think that Stonewall was to start direct, you know, directing traffic, mm-hmm. more or less. So at that point is where that assistant came, or Stonewall wouldn't... Two things Stonewall didn't do at that juncture. He didn't meet with Turner Ashby directly to say, what's, what's the situation? What's going yeah. on here? Secondly, he didn't meet with Garnett and say, this, I'm sending Fulkerson in frontal attack. I want to... The whole point of that frontal attack, and I don't know why they went that way. They could have gone down Apple Valley and, and went back up Middle Road if they wanted to attack the left flank of Pritchard's Hill, which is what they were trying to do. They were trying to turn. I want you to turn that battery is what Stonewall said. Turning that battery in military terms is I want you to, to, to take that flank that battery. Mm-hmm. So when Fulkerson and his men went through that field, they just got decimated. And then you start seeing the battle map. And when you look at these battle maps, you start seeing that arrow start going off to the west when they start Stonewall. Taking a wide. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's when Stonewall sent those, those three, three batteries up to, uh, to Sandy Ridge. And he said that's where the artillery duel was going to start. And he had five uh, artillery units, um, but it was the uh, McLaughlin, Waters, and Carpenters batteries that would set one, two, three up on, on uh, Sandy Ridge. That's when the artillery barrage was happening. And the, and, the, and the Union, they had put their infantry at the base of Pritchard's Hill, waiting for that frontal, if, if, if uh, Fulkerson got through. Um, so those guns up on, on Sandy Ridge, once they started firing, they were just reaching that base. So they're getting into the Union lines mm-hmm. at the base of, of Pritchard's Hill. But at that time, Garnett was confused. He, he had sent only half of his men to support Fulkerson. The other half were on their way up to... Sandy Ridge, uh, Stonewall was had already taken Garnett's batteries and started deploying them himself. <laughs> so he wasn't even telling Garnett what what he was doing up there. Yeah. So there was there was real lack of communication at the onset of that of that battle. So when the infantry, the Confederate infantry, started making their way up to Sandy Ridge, that's when he sent uh, you know units up that would eventually get to that Stonewall and the glass farm. At, uh, at uh, Rose Hill, their whole point was to get back and take out the Robinson Union battery that had been placed over on Pritchard's Hill. Well, they they placed them over Middle Road on the other side of Middle Road. Oh there, yeah, there's a church there yep. now, uh, but they set them over there. So the whole point of Jackson, he could see that battery from from Sandy Ridge, and he was sending them around to go up Cedar Creek Grade and catch them from behind. But in doing so, at the same time, Kimball had called up Tyler's uh, men. What had been kind of they came down from Stevenson's Depot. They're the ones who rolled into town playing John Brown's body, and Mrs. Lee up here uh, was all up in arms about it. Huh. <laughs> um, but they came and they stopped right around. They held up right around where Burger King is on Valley Avenue, and they stayed there until Kimball called them into action. He said, "Head up Cedar Creek Grade." until you get into the woods, which is the woods on the other side of 37 overpass mm-hmm. and head west. South. South. Yeah. Yeah, south. So um, so the Confederates, and they're coming at the same time. With the same, with this, which is so ironic is that they're both going after batteries. Yeah. They're both kind of, that, that's what they were trying to do because Carpenter's battery was on the furthest. On Sandy Ridge. That's right. And- so they were trying to go after Carpenter's battery. And... Uh, so the Confederates made it to that wall that behind behind Rose Hill first. Yeah, what's a, yeah, what stood between them was that wall 
it's just, yeah, what are the odds of that? You know, they're both same yeah. objectives on each side. Timing. And, and then it, there's a wall. Well, and it, and it comes down to, and you and I have both have discussed this in the past, is that when the military has to, when the military of, with that many men uh, are marching through woods, it's easier to have a tight, you know, compact uh, group. Mm-hmm. So you're not so flared out. You're, you're, you know, you might be 30 to 50 men wide, but, you know, quarter of a mile deep. Mm-hmm. So coming through those woods like that and coming out on that other side of the woods to a stone wall, which was on a rise, you know, uh, with only 320 Confederates behind it at that time. Um, but they were, it was, they were being decimated. Those Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia guys that were coming out of those woods were just being eaten up quickly until Tyler could figure, could, could figure it out and start flaring them out more. But, uh, you know, they'd spend two, two to three hours at that wall. Yeah, this you know? and, and to, we'll try to put the map up, the, the Hotchkiss map of the battle. But this stone wall runs west to east as well and into the side and up um, of Sandy Ridge, which, which is running north to south. Yeah, and it, rig- and, and it, it, it didn't get cut away by 37. Uh, the wall stopped before mm-hmm. 37 even then. But there's a series of walls on that glass property. There's the main wall that mm-hmm. they fought over. And then there's one that's the next wall that's further, south of it. South of it. And then, then there's another wall. That these Confederates would go back to. Yeah. So in the later phases of the war, those walls would. would and the, yeah, this this wall is on yeah, the east, the western side of Sandy Ridge running west to east. So you have the protection to your flank with your artillery up on uh, Sandy Ridge firing to the east to Pritchard's Hill where there's what what is it 16 guns of federal guns on Pritchard's Hill before they move Robinson's to the other side of yeah. the middle road and what they did with <clears throat> what they did the Confederates did with Carpenters Carpenters was the furthest um which direction would that be would, would that be, be like north or yeah, south yeah north yeah. um they tur- they they turned that Carpenters battery around and started firing into Tyler's uh, guys left flank yeah um and doing a lot of damage but that's where garnett um you know jackson woods estates that mm-hmm. subdivision um i always wondered i thought when i was a kid i used to think that that's where jackson was was making all of his decisions which like, you would think based off the name <laughs> right but um jackson was moving around he was very um hands-on uh back in those woods but that's actually where the first group of confederates met after coming off of the base of Pritchard's Hill. Mm-hmm. And that's when they were started getting, getting delegated and, and, and told where to go. And that's where there's an area up there called Garnett's Field. Um, and that's kind of where Garnett was starting to, you know, he would fill the 33rd in an, on that wall, you know, the 37th. And, you know, they, they just started popping, filling holes. On the wall, yeah. That's right. And what's so funny is that um, how fast Fulkerson got back up on that ridge from being in a position where he was being destroyed in that open field at the base of Pritchard's Hill by the time. And I, and I, we discussed this too, when Thoburn, the union, uh, uh, Colonel. Yep. Tho- Colonel. Yeah. When he came out of those woods, um, he had taken the West Virginians to the right, to the right flank, uh, of the wall. And there's a there's a perpendicular wall that comes off of that main wall. It's been rebuilt. It's pretty cool up there. There's only a few remaining sections of that original wall as you go up the hill. Uh, the section that you see now has been rebuilt. Mm-hmm. It's still cool. The center was more right to the right up mm-hmm. the hill a little more, but there is a perpendicular wall that comes off of that wall. And Thoburn came to the on the right of that wall uh, and tried to flank that wall. Uh, Fulkerson made it just in time. To f- to be there with, with about 500 yeah. men and, re, and, and repulsed the attack and they shot Thoburn. He got taken off the field. He got shot in the arm, but they had to jump on the other. He, actually, they were on the left of the perpendicular wall was taking so much heat that they had to jump onto the right of that wall for, for cover. Uh, and then Fulkerson was able to, to drive them back. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to note too, at the beginning with, Fulkerson's advance. The only way you can kind of get this perspective is by going to Pritchard's Hill and standing where all those federal guns were on Pritchard's Hill. Yeah. And then 
just you can still see the same wood lot that Fulkerson hugged the right of or the, the eastern side of mm-hmm. and then took a sharp left turn in the direction of Sandy Ridge. And you're like, you know, it's like what you said earlier. It's like, why not use the road the other three, the fourth, second, and 27th Virginia regiments used to go to Sandy Ridge. But instead they walk along a wood lot and then in front of the wood lot an open view of those 16 guns and all federal regiments. Yeah. And, and if you're, when you're up on Pritchard's Hill, I was just up there a couple of days ago. Um, when you look down, you'll see a barn with a silo. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple uh, interpretive markers to the right of that silo. That's that's the position. Well, you can look off to the left of the barn and see the f- open field, and you just see how flat and open and easy it would have been to rain artillery down on that position. Where that silo is is where Fulkerson broke off, and and headed to headed to Sandy Ridge. But um, it, it was just a very weird opening. To, to the battle because I think it was it, they didn't really know how the infantry was going to play and, or, or fall into this battle uh, until you know that rush to that to that wall and that's where it all that's really where it all took place yeah and, the battle I mean you'd think based off of the opening scenes and before we even got to the stone wall you'd think okay and kind of what you people would know from the battle and what's been preserved and things like that You'd go, okay, the battle was at the Pritchard's farm, and it was at Pritchard's Hill, and they assaulted Pritchard's Hill, and it's like, no, it was obvious from the beginning that that's not what you're assaulting, but just the complete chaos of getting to where you need to be, yeah. which is the ridge to the, 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 the battle's really for Sandy Ridge, like, once the stone wall comes into play. Um, yeah, it's different. It's completely different from Second Kernstown, mm-hmm. where everything kind of takes place right around the Pritchard's house and the stone wall that fronts that, that road. This was a Stonewall Jackson being a uh, artillery tactician, and I think it, c- it comes back from his his days in the Mexican War and also from VMI. He he saw that Sandy Ri- he saw the Sandy Ridge position and knew that's where he had to put those guns, and that's and he was going to be he was hell bent on getting those up there, and they got them up there pretty pretty quickly, and it just turned into an artillery battle. They said within the three they said within the three hours or four hours of that artillery it was 700 rounds mm-hmm. that flew over those those fields back and forth so i mean it was a it was a massive display but it, it just was too the, the line up there at the at the at the wall was too thin then you throw in into the, the elements of of miscommunication. So you have Fulkerson and Garnett's men up there not taking orders from one or the other. Nobody was really in command. Garnett couldn't, couldn't tell those men what to do and vice versa. So they, the chain of command was, was breaking down up there. Um, they didn't, you know, that was what Lee was so good at. Lee was able to, to ascertain what was weak and fill that, fill that gap. They, they just didn't have that. They didn't have a. They had some good guys up there, um, you know. Um, name escapes me with. The, uh, but they had. It was like it was a battle that was being run by um, lower officers, mm-hmm. and they did. A, I mean, it was, it was a fantastic job at that wall. And it's always I always think about if they if they would have brought those those ammunition stores up from Newtown and had them at their disposal, um, they would have made it to nighttime. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time the battle, it was dusk. The sun was setting. Six o'clock. It was yeah. almost six thirty. And it was it was Garnett, was it not? That was that gave the call to the Virginians to fall back from yeah. that wall. So they surrendered that position when they could have, yeah, technically held it, but at what cost? Well, you know, there was there were men who ran out of ammunition that were already running back. And Stonewall actually had stopped one and said, "Hey, where are you going?" And he said, "I'm out of ammunition." And he said, "Well, go back and give them the bayonet." And, As Jackson you know, does, typical, yeah. Yeah, typical, typical, right? But at that point, people were were leaving that wall, and it was actually Garnett who who uh, he saw a res- the, the only reserve unit that came that w- wasn't engaged was getting ready to get into the fight, and he said, and, and Garnett stopped him and said, "All you can be is is you know pr- you know protect the rear yeah. for the for the for the retreat." Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where those two other stone walls come into play. And that was the one that would be, would border the, um, Deering 
first wall. Mm-hmm. That's the yep. that was the first wall. The second one is at the Davmar subdivision off of J- Jones Road. Still uh, there too, correct? Still there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Original wall. And and that's what gets me about growing up. I, I grew up several years in Stonebrook. Then I then I finished out my high school years in Brookneal. And uh, when you get into Brookneal, you cross. Have you been in Brookneal subdivision? There's a there's I don't a believe so. Down in the middle is you, you go down and you cross over. Um, it's kind of a spring, and, you know. It's um, back in the early 1900s. It was like a resort. They had made a big lake out of it. But during the Civil War, it was called Neal's Dam, and they called the woods around it. They called it the Big Woods. And uh, you know, you got to remember, there's a couple like Barton was fighting in that mm-hmm. battle. So these guys were locals. Yeah, they had probably. Bell. You know, I mean, it's, Robert Sherrard Bell was in the Rockbridge Artillery. He gets yeah. captured at this battle. He was there. A lot of those guys were captured there because mm-hmm. um, they what they had decided. Well, the Union cavalry had ridden around um, right in between Funston. You remember Funston? Um, he was a colonel. He was he was with Ashby. Ashby had had divided his men in half. And if you're if you're standing in front of Rose Hill, the house, mm-hmm. and you look off towards Stonebrook, and there's a there's a big hill right there, mm-hmm. and Funston was on that on that hill with two hundred. Calvary up there extending what would virtually be like if you looked at it on a map the left flank of that's the Confederates. right yeah and it was probably supposed to to maybe protect that flank at, at some point they never really were that engaged but the but the Union cavalry slipped in between Funston and that of the, uh, the wall yeah and got in got in on along pretty much along Jones Road and rode back to Neal's Dam and started collecting prisoners um, and there's a guy, Langhorn. I just wrote a story about Langhorn. Uh, he was a lieutenant and he got into those woods and he had actually, he was actually uh, mounted and he got off his mount and slapped his horse on the rear and, and started running through the woods because he felt the men felt that uh, it was harder for the U- U S cavalry to get into the woods and capture. So they thought they could go through those woods through Bro- what Brook Neal subdivision is and pop out on the other side of middle road. Mm-hmm. There's a road up there called firelock court off a of middle road right it would have taken you right down to to where jackson was retreating which was back across shady elm and back to springdale mm-hmm. and, back, and then down down uh, route 11 but uh langhorn got caught in there got surrounded he started firing his pistol they shot him in the side he threw his pistol down because it jammed he pulled pulled a sword out started swinging a sword all around at everybody um then they, i think they shot him again he threw his sword at the guy and then pulled his pistol out to load his second pistol, and they shot him like two more times. Uh, and then he fi- he finally he took his ring off and said, "Give this ring to my mother and let her know that I would rather die than surrender." But that happened right there at the Brook Neal Bridge. Wow! You know? And I passed it every day in my life and never knew it. And no one thinks often that the battle would extend that, which is not that far from the main Confederate line, but still, it's like it's a good mile. Yeah, from from the main battle lines. I mean, that's a skedaddle. They were moving. They were trying to get out of there. And, th- and you had that last faction that was at that last stone wall, that Davmar subdivision stone wall, that was holding off that, that last onslaught to give them that 20 minutes. They, they, said they gave them about 20 minutes um, to, get, to get those men down Middle Road and out that farm. There's a, the, the stone house is still there. Um, where they, There's an old lane that used to go all the way across Shady Elm and down to... to uh, to Valley Avenue or to uh, Route 11, and uh, the lane is still there. You can still see it. You can, hmm. you can drive back there and look at it. So as um, as the Confederates are kind of stonewall hopping here, um, or at this point, and Tyler's guys are putting pressures on the stonewall, and you know the Confederate communication is just falling apart. What's what's happening with? the rest of the infantry that's kind of on Pritchard's in that open ground between well, Pritchard's. The, the, the far right flank, um, the far right flank at the top of the hill had to hinge back. And I think it was the second, is it second Virginia? Second Virginia. And yeah. then there's the 21st Virginia battalion. Yeah. They, up there. they more or less, they started getting heat from, from the infantry that was being, that uh, Kimball was sending off of Pritchard's Hill. So Carpenter's battery is up there and that they had to get, they got turned um, and had to start pulling back. Uh, then you had Waters' uh, battery, and that's an interesting thing because 
there is a Colonel Murray from the 14th Pennsylvania that came up. Do you see the 14th Pennsylvania coming up the hill? Yeah. Yeah. Colonel Murray was coming up. and, and it's Indiana, set, you mean? There's no, a 14th. It, there's, an 84th eight, well, there's an 84th and there should be a 14th, I okay. think. Okay. But um, <clears throat> sad story about him is that he he was – his subord his, – his NCOs put together a, a petition, and I think they had a good many sin- signatures on there, uh, asking him to resign, that he was not a good officer, and they, they wanted him to resign. So – and it's funny how these – when you get slighted in the Civil War, how you overcompensate – in the next battle to try mm-hmm. to get that, regain that honor. Mm-hmm. You know, Garnett would do that at Gettysburg and die on the field and yeah. buried on the field somewhere. Um, the same with Colonel Murray. He comes up and they try to take uh, the Waters battery, the middle battery. Mm-hmm. And he gets, they say that he got shot to where his in, hat insignia was, was driven into his brain. Like wow. his, yeah, I mean, it was like that. It was that bad. It freaked. It freaked out those guys. I mean, it it was something pretty bad. But mm. the guy who gave him the most praise from after the battle was the guy who was the first signature on his you know, request for resignation. But they wanted to put a monument up there for him. Uh, they because they were able to take it, take that 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 battery. Well, they pushed the battery back. Mm-hmm. Stonewall lost one piece of artillery up there because the, I think the wheel got the case on or something got blown or, you know, the wheel got blown off or something of that nature. But, um, but they said, you know, if they would have had, the Confederates would have had more, um, uh, rigid command up on that wall. They could have taken that 500 man Fulkerson was probably reduced down to 400 maybe by that time, but they could have taken that far left flank pushed it back up onto the onto the ridge to line up along that ridge line to protect against their artillery against that infantry because they had no there's no way to stop it yeah because that's like the second you know you get the one punch to the face from tyler at the stone wall and that's like a couple yeah. hour long punch and then you've got the you know the left hook coming in from those regiments coming from pritchard's hill to sandy ridge yeah. That's just that those poor guys on the curve of the the line at the stone wall just have to see that coming and take it, yeah. and your artillery's turning and just complete chaos. And and Gary is it Gary Eckelbarg? E- yeah, Eckelbarger. Eckelbarger, great great book. Uh, we are in for it. Yeah, that is our book recommendation for this episode. Yeah, yeah. it's an incredible book and so well written. Um, but he says it was kind of the perfect, um, uh, the perfect situation. For the Union up on that hill, not purpose. You know, it wasn't on purpose. wasn't pers- you know a directive by Kimball. Um, it just kind of happened that way, where they were just kind of boom, boom, boom mm-hmm. down the line a- a- as they're coming from the Cedar Creek grade side, um, hitting that side of the hill and hitting that hitting that uh, Confederate artillery from the front side from the Pritchard Hill side. Mm-hmm. And it was just a per- in perfect timing yeah. in unison that it, that it, could, it couldn't have been planned any better. Uh, and that's what eventually pu- pushed that artillery off the hill. And once that, once it was off the hill and the artillery was done, it was like, we're done. And there was a point in the battle where, uh, where uh, Turner Ashby tells uh, Stonewall that he, he, he thinks they're facing 10,000. And he said, don't speak, don't speak of it. You know, you know, don't, don't, don't talk. I mean, it's close. It's 8,500 men that, yeah. that they're coming against and the Confederates only have 3,800. Um, and I mean, do you, can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on what's happening on the, on the east side of the Valley Pike? You know, I know we mentioned with Ashby initially starting, but some of those guys under, I think it's Sullivan. Um, yeah. You mean in the last phase? Is that in the last phase? I'm just trying to make sure. Yeah, those guys were held in reserve. Anybody okay. east of the pike, that that main action in the early mornings of the 20th. That's where the bat. Yeah, that that was all the early action. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. and that goes all the way back to Trex. You know where Trex is on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I've kind of driven that back there to mm-hmm. see, and I've done it with the key, with the map key and everything, and more or less that Confederate push and line and battle that was happening there, uh, engagement that was happening there was all the way from Route 11 all the way to Trex forward which is yeah it's like there's that road that, next to the bank where savage's house was and distillery yeah that road i forget the name of it but it's goes out and the youth development centers right there yeah on that road and the, yeah basically that action takes place 
from the Valley Pike East all the way to where that road ends. And yeah. Shawnee Drive, isn't it? I think it's Shawnee yeah. Drive, yeah. yeah. And Hog Run goes down that and curves up with it as well. And yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's the initial phase, and it shifts to the Pritchard's Hill, and then from there just shifts to Sandy Ridge and absolute yeah. chaos. Yeah, and, there, and there's, <clears throat> I always see on all the maps, you'll see a house called the Mahaney House. And if you you'll look on if you look on the map, it's kind of it's below Kernstown on the left side of the pike, and it says Mahaney, and that was a brick house that was used mm-hmm. by both sides. But it's always kind of my point of reference. And I did I did the key to see how far down that is, and there's a house that's always for sale down below yeah. below a used car lot mm-hmm. and and the Seven Eleven. Yeah, it's kind of like smack in the middle of those two. That's where the Mahaney house was, and that's kind of where. That's kind of where uh, they collected all the, the Confederate artillery at about noon or one o'clock. That's where kind of where they kind of decided what to do, and that's where they kind of left from. So it's kind of cool. I mean, there's if you if you if you go to the Kernstown battlefield, I mean, those guys are just in, incredible. They'll take you down to the flats, and I think you said you know would it be cool to go up on Pritchard's Hill and, and get that vantage point. But it's even cooler to go down to to Fulkerson's position and looking up at that at that position, you can see. It oh just, yeah, it, it wasn't going to work. It could yeah. not work. So let's talk about a little bit of our friends over at the Kernstown Battlefield Association. Yeah. Um, they they operate. I don't know the total acreage count over there. It's a hundred, couple hundred acres of the Pritchard Grimm Farm, um, which is the site of Fulkerson's advance and has Pritchard's Hill on it and significant for the second battle of Kernstown and the opening phases of the second battle of Winchester. Um, and they fully run that off of volunteer support and donations. Um, and they're open up until October 29th of this year. So on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So you can go there and they've recently updated a lot of their interpretive signage. Um, and they just acquired the, Artillery positions up on Sandy Ridge. Yeah, so ABT, the American Battlefield Trust, preserved, I think it's 20-something acres there on Sandy Ridge on the west side of Highway or Route 37, which is the, yeah, probably the southern line of, of um, it's either McLa- Sandy Ridge. It's either McLaughlin's position or Waters' position, or a little of both. McLaughlin's guys are the – that's Rockbridge, right? Artillery. Um, you asked me too fast. I know. You can think about yes, it. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. So, that's those Rockbridge guys are there, Rockbridge Artillery. Um, yeah. McLaughlin was Rockbridge. Waters was West Augusta. And Carpenter was Allegheny. Okay. Yeah. And But like you said, the best approach, the best way to view Pritchard's Hill, at least in, if you're trying to understand, you know, what the heck was happening on that property on March 23rd, 1862, the be- like you said, Best perspectives from the Confederate perspective, I think, just to get and you. They've cut in now a trail that it's the, like the, called the Fulkerson Trail, and you walk or you can march <laughs> or hike the right. approach of Fulkerson's guys hugging the sides of the woods and then turning left. And that whole time you're walking it, you can see just Pritchard's Hill staring at you, and um, the interpretive signs that are up on that hill. And um, that's the best place to view it. And then, like you said, those guys are super great, and you catch them at a good time. And if they're feeling lovey like they always are, they'll take you over to Sandy Ridge. They're figuring out how they can get it publicly accessible. But they'll take you up to that property. They just acquired There's some interpretive signs there now. They've cleared a ton. There's a view shed cleared from Sandy Ridge where you can see all the way across yeah, to Pritchard's right. Hill. <clears throat> yeah. So then you get that vantage point as well of how that federal attack, infantry attack came and what the artillery duel was looking like. And then um, right next to that property, but they're not connected yet, hopefully in the future, um, but they touch, is the Rose Hill Park, which you were mentioning where the stone wall is, uh, where they've reconstructed a little bit of it. Um, and that's owned by the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley, but maintained and operated by Frederick County as a park. So it's Rose Hill Park off Jones Road. And... Um, you can go there and hike, and they've gotten some interpretive signs there, but you can go to the stone wall and, you know, hike up the other side. of Sandy Ridge comes on that property too, and and uh, you can get on top of that. And you won't get the same view you'll get from the Kernstown Battlefield Association's part of Sandy Ridge, but you'll understand what it was like when the Confederates were funneling in and uh, then the attack from Tyler's guys. So there's a lot to see when you're touring Kernstown. Um, and one thing we didn't mention, but I know you might have some things to add about this, Mike, is this is like, you know, this is the first 
this isn't called the first battle of Kernstown as it happens. This is called the battle of Winchester until May of 1862, because this is the first big, large engagement to take place in this area. And is known in a lot of accounts as the battle of Winchester. So this is not just the first taste of war and battle for a lot of these troops engaged, but for the citizens of this area. And I know, and this is a point I always make to people is, you know, there was folks that were kids were coming out and watching the battle. And I, I don't know if you know a little bit more about those accounts of civilians from the town going out and watching the battle. Yeah. Um, I know that Cornelia Peake McDonald, I mean, she, if you think about as a crow flies, I mean, she's on Amherst street. They could hear it. And, th- and that's another thing too, is that <clears throat> Kimball was very good at, at hearing musketry and reading it. And there's accounts where he could hear how that musketry was being fired. Was it being fired in unison? How soon was the re- was the the retort of, of the return of, of fire? The yeah. return of fire, um, or if it was sporadic firing? Why? And he was very good and astute at hearing what was going on up there. But Stonewall said, you know, and people would say that you know who had been in battle, it was it was more musketry than they had heard at 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 Manassas. And uh, Stonewall would write, actually write about how the sound of musketry was, was so loud and, and continuous. Um, so it makes you realize how they would run out of ammunition. Um, you know, because they were running out of ammunition at the wall. They were, Kimball was running out of ammunition on Pritchard's Hill. Um, but for, for the civilians, I know that uh, Kate Sperry came out to the battlefield uh, and actually took a stone, a rock out of the rock wall and a bullet that she found on the ground um, and took that with her after the battle. Do we know where those are today? I, no? I but that's crazy that I she's don't. like, you know, artifact collecting yeah, it's, right it's, after the battle. It's actually on the interpretive sign at Rose Hill. It tells you how much I read when I'm there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you get over by the, the, the glass house, it's, oh, okay. it's, it's on, one of those, okay. on one of those markers. Um, but, you know, Mrs. Lee, they would go up on Mr. Brown's roof Right next door, right yeah. Right next door. They would go up on the roof and, and, and watch the battle. I know they could watch third battle very easily from up there. Um, but another thing that's very interesting is that, you know, you've got shields. Um, well, you've, you know, Banks left at 3 o'clock mm-hmm. that day. He went to Harpers Ferry. Um, he's like, you got everything, you everything good here? Well, that's... That, Are you cool? Yeah, I mean, we didn't go into detail about it, but that's the whole point. Jackson's Jackson got orders to not allow federal troops to help... Yeah, J- Johnston Johnston told Jackson to press as much as he could without getting fully engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, Banks uh, was getting reports that it was nothing more than uh, Ashby Cavalry of more than not more than seven hundred. So so he was going to go back to D.C. and he then from there possibly towards Richmond, and that was against. Well, yeah, what Jackson <clears throat> should allow. And, so and Banks had already sent Sedgwick and Williams. In support of the, the of of uh, McClellan, so that's he got rid of half of his men almost r- right away. So that's Jackson's like I gotta act fast. Yeah, and but but Jackson was kind of under the impression that there wasn't as many. Mm-hmm. There were, you know, I think all said and done, I think they had uh, Union had all, up to eight thousand. Yeah. Um, but Gary makes a very very uh, good point in his book. And from all military uh, manuals and, and uh, tactics, if if an army is going to hit a fixed position, you need three to one to take that position. They didn't have three to one in, in Tyler's yeah. brigade. So if Stonewall would have had the ammunition, they may have held off long enough to at least um, you know leave the field with their tail between their legs, but but salvaged. You know, they lost a lot of men. When you look at the 750 that they consider missing casualties or killed, um, 250 of those were captured in, in the woods around Brook Neal. You know, yeah. so, but um, another thing that, it, that we didn't talk about is the signal stations that were set up between Kernstown and the Seaver House on Braddock or on Boscowan. Um, it was kind of the first time the Signal Corps was ever really used in battle, in a real battle. And they had about three to four signal stations running from Pritchard's Hill, probably Hollingsworth Mill, Bowers Hill, then to the Seaver House. House. And they were running flags. So the only way I knew about that was I saw somebody had a flag for sale, like a signal flag, which was given to one of the signalmen, and it said Winchester on it. 
but it had the Kernstown date. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes back into what you were talking about. At that time, they were still calling it the Battle of Win Winchester. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's just kind of really interesting that uh, they actually gave commendations for the first time in military history for Signal Corps at Kernstown. Yeah, because and the whole purpose of that is because is it Shields? Shields thinks he's in command still. He thinks he's commanding the battle from his bed in Winchester, <laughs> and Kimball's like, "Whoa, I got this." And he's and, and he still thinks it's a very small Confederate force all the way up until three p.m. You know, by the time that I think I think Banks is out the door at three fifteen, and at that time Shields is still thinking that it's a very small thing. Seems like both sides were just like ma massively misinformed about the other, and they're just kind of going at it <clears throat> until they can well, absolutely. finally but, figure and, something out about the other. And, and, she and Shields told Kimball, I, uh, I want you to pursue. And Kimball's like, I'm not doing that. He went up on Pritchard's Hill and, and plopped down on Pritchard's Hill, which was, you know, the smart thing to do. I mean, it was, a, it was the... The, the, you know, and it's kind of funny. Sandy Ridge is, I think they said, ninety feet higher than Pritchard's Hill. Yeah. Um, which, if you look at it, you can't can't it, tell. It can't really tell. So hard nowadays. Um, but that that ninety feet elevation made gave, a huge it, difference. It, it made it, it, it. Confederates were able to to get those shells, you know, pretty close. Yeah, because you might be wondering, well, why leave Pritchard's Hill? But it's that exact reason. It's you know, Sandy Ridge is the hill to have if you're going to have a hill. And it, um, and it would just it, and if they wouldn't have moved the infantry to take those artillery each each of their part, artillery positions, it just would have been an artillery duel, and they would have packed up and yeah. left at six o'clock, and it would have, we never really heard of, ever heard about it. They just but both it, decided to flank at the same yeah, time. yeah at the same time. Into, and then Jackson pulls. Well, Jackson doesn't pull out, but Garnett's yeah. guys pulls. Yeah, pull out. And um, I guess the biggest takeaway from this battle, as it all obviously from what we've talked about, is it's a uh, technically. A, Union victory because Jackson leaves the field, but the, the most talked about thing with First Kernstown is how it's a you know Jackson's first and only defeat. But in the grand scheme of things, and air quotes with this because you know everyone says it, Confederate defeat, Jackson defeat, but it's a tactical victory. They always say, yeah, and that's because the bigger picture, and and we talk about this in later episodes about the Valley Campaign and other and battles in it. But yeah, it's now eyes are on Jackson in the Valley because of what just happened at Kernstown and in, in, in and around Winchester. Banks' eyes are now focused in, in the Federal Army, Army of the Potomac. It's like, oh crap, there's, you know, Jackson in the Valley. And this is the other historians, and we talk about this with, with uh, Aaron Seaver in another episode, but it's, you know, when does the Valley campaign start? Some people say, you know, with the Battle of McDowell on May 8th, 1862. Some people say it starts January 1st, 1862, because he's nonstop moving, and Bath Romney is basically just combined with this campaign. Um, but majority of historians just, just go with First Kernstown as being the start of the Valley Campaign. And you got to remember, <clears throat> you got to remember, Nathaniel Banks was third in command. Yeah, he's the third time. highest ranking third, officer. That's right. <laughs> third highest ranking. <clears throat> he's just the former Speaker of the House, new military background. That's right. And, and, and also, it's an embarrassment. Yeah. I mean, for him. Being the third highest ranking, he leaves the field and leaves it to a subordinate. Now, I like James Shields. I like the guy. I mean, he's he's one of these rough Irish guys. Uh, people don't know that when he first came to America, he was shipwrecked, one of only three men to survive, and he gets shipwrecked on an island, and he ends up staying on that island for like three years. <laughs> wow. then, he, then he gets back. Then he he's coming to meet his brother here in the in the states. By the time he gets here, he finds out his brother's dead. So this guy, I mean, he's he, he just went through a lot of adversity. Now, and he was kind of a he was kind of a Mexican War badass. I mean, he was at Cerro Gordo. He was at Ch uh, Chapultepec. Uh, you know, he's he was at which is funny. He was at I'm pronouncing that right, Chapultepec. Uh, he was there, and Jackson was there. Both artillery. I think they were both artillery guys. I think, but I'd have to double check that. Shields probably was infantry, but um, but it's uh, it's Shields doesn't get a lot of credit, but also it's it's all Kimball to me, um, and it goes back to what we were originally saying that Jackson um, just a bad day for him in terms of yeah. not, of not really 
knowing what what he what the objective was didn't know the size that he was dealing with but see a lot of people say that it was that it was you know it it did what Johnston set out to do it kept eyes on the valley uh, so they weren't sending men to to aid McClellan but the thing is they he had a uh, banks had already sent Sedgwick yeah. and, and Williams to McClellan so that had already happened sending more maybe the audacity um, and the bravado of of Jackson was definitely got got their attention all the way up to Lincoln's attention, but I think it was a you know, I think it was all a kind of a mistake yeah in a, in in a way, but um, but he would you know Jackson would redeem himself um, in those ways you know the Garnet court martial uh, would only be stopped at Jackson's death you know that ran yeah. that ran all the way to Jackson's death wow. You know, and then Garnett, of course, dies on the field at, at Gettysburg. And this is kind of a f- weird side story, is that when they collected the dead, um, I guess his jacket had been stripped off of him. Um, and he was just, you know, usually officers in higher ranking, especially generals, uh, with that embroidery on your sleeve, mm-hmm. they would have they pulled you off to the side. You know, they still respected they would attend to you. Yeah, they would atten- Yeah, they would attend to you. Got you. Try to get you back, probably home. You know, mm-hmm. they would do. They're doing things like that. Uh, they threw him in a mass grave with all the rest of the dead they found on the field. They found his sword in 1910 in a uh, like a antique store in Baltimore, and it had his inscription, Richard Brooke Garnett, on the on the wow. on the uh, scabbard, and uh, they think there was just a. A Union soldier field pickup. Yeah, his body has never been never found identified on the field. Yeah, so. he's, he's in the. You know they were pretty good about those. Um, you know those battle those battlefield graveyards being uh, dug up and reentered, re-entered. yeah, reentered into a in the national battlefield uh, uh, cemetery, and that's what they Winchester did the same thing in 1866. You know, but you didn't get them all. No, no. And there's men. They're still out there. They're, oh, they're, they're, uh, Kate Sperry, who came, you know, collected the rock and the bullet off the rock wall. She said it when she got up there, they were burying the Confederate dead up there. And she said there were about 50 of them. Mm-hmm. And they were burying them just hastily in a, in a grave that's somewhere up on Sandy Ridge. They may have gotten to them. They may not have. You never know. Yeah. It's wow. ho- definitely hollowed ground. There's yeah. no way they got them all. It's so wooded up there, too. It's so thick. And it was it was pretty wooded up there then, so if you were killed up there in those woods, you know, you know, it's just uh, they're, they're still up there. Yeah, it's a very it's a beautiful place. Yeah, beautiful, preserved battlefield. Anybody who's never been there should go. Oh yeah, you'll learn so much. But the thing is, you'll be able to stand up on that hill and put yourself in that position and feel you know that tan- I call it tangible history, and that's why I do what I do. Is that you know I I love touching holding finding history telling the story about it but it's the closest thing that you can get to to being in that battle yeah i mean this doesn't looking at a map and reading about it in a book is one thing but no. you won't fully get the picture of what we're talking about or what a what a book's talking about or what a map's showing until you stand on it yeah and yeah and, and try to imagine the whistling and screaming of artillery shells coming at you mm-hmm. you know and i tell that i try to tell that to people around here all the time it's like you go about your daily business and getting your Starbucks and going to your different things, and that's great and that's fine. But you you got to know that that men were trying to kill each, each other here. Not that long ago, either. Not, not that long ago. Yeah. And it's just it, you know you don't have to go in deep if you don't want to, but it's pretty damn interesting. Yeah. If you if you just uh, you know just recognize it, yeah, and identify it. And I have a lot of people who tell me that the most important thing I got out of doing the Winchester Tales books was that people who would come up to me and say, "I've been working in that place for ten years and had no idea that that was a Civil War hospital, yeah, or something of that nature." Yeah, and that makes me happy because it's just I've I've educated somebody to see the world in a little bit of a different way now. Yeah, you know that we're not. You know, just because we're here presently doesn't mean that nothing really happened. Yeah. You know, so it's just kind of makes people more a little self-aware, yeah. historically self-aware. Well, and that's why I'm so thankful that you did what you did and you're doing what you're doing because it's, you know, it's work that tons of other people have, you know, tried to do or do for different audiences and you were able to bring it to life uh, for the masses that, 
you know, or just check in their Facebook feed. And it's like, whoa, my friend I went to high school with shared this. And it's like, you know, never knew that. So um, thank you so much for, for coming on this episode and talking Absolutely. First Currents down with us. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, sipping some fun. rye whiskey. <laughs> it's, and, got a, uh, it's got a good burn. Yeah. No, it's uh, we're, we're excited. And uh, stay tuned. We'll definitely have you on in the future to talk about many other Winchester things and Valley things. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. And we look forward to uh, doing another episode. So. We'll catch you on the next one. Yep.